some situations of, of how God works in just little things, but time's not going to allow me to get into a whole lot of that. We'll probably throw that in in, in future lessons. T today's kind of this history geography lesson, lesson number eight, if you have a lesson book, uh, going through the book of Ezekiel. And again, I want to start, I appreciate Ron teaching last week. That was, um, again, Hawaii's four hours ahead of, or five hours ahead, so at five in the morning, we're up watching, watching that. I pr appreciate it. Um, especially I'd prepared some things, but he'd added some stuff and, and, and put some things in that I had not put in that he had, he had added in I thought was, was excellent. I appreciate him taking the time to go do that, even though he didn't feel sorry for us with our long plane trip. But that's for those who were here last week, you got to hear about that. And um, Again, we're going to be Ezekiel chapters 25 through 28. Several nations, and again, it's, uh, as Ron was kind of summarizing last week, you spend a lot of time, Israel just getting beat the fire out of them. The first 24 chapters of Ezekiel, if you're Israel, you're saying, please, please stop. Please stop. It's like judgment, 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 hammer, and they're already in captivity. The, the, Jerusalem has not fallen yet. By the time we get to this portion of Scripture, Jerusalem is about to fall and ultimately give over. Um, the, the next set of chapters is about God pouring out his judgment or, or providing a judgment upon the people that had given them a hard time. Again, the, the Israelites were, were really a mockery, had made a mockery of the things of God. And they're going to talk about that where people you know, treated them as a joke. Today's lesson about the, dealing with the sins of the nation. James chapter 4, verse 7 is the, the author's desire to, to get into a, a great verse. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And boy, that's, that sounds easy. Um, and it should be that way. First uh, John 4, 4 that talks about a year of God, little children have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But a verse I would want to use for this chapter, or this set of chapters, is, is over in the book of Galatians, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, he that soweth to the Spirit. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. That God is a God who just lays out, here's what truth is, and you can get what you want. No, nobody gets away with anything. Unlike a lot of parts of life, I mean, if you watch, if you're a sports fan, there are people that get away with things, the foul that didn't get called in basketball or the, the penalty that didn't get called in football, the pass interview. I mean, it's, it seems like game after game, it's, hey, this, this thing happened, how did the referees blow that? God's not going to blow any call when it comes to our lives. You know, what are, what are we doing that makes a difference for eternity? God's going to go evaluate all of that. Uh, I certainly did some, some meditating on things, and again, just um, some of the considerations of, hey, what are we here for? What is, what's purpose? Again, the older I get, got to celebrate another birthday, which, which adds another year to age, and I, I recognize if all things being considered, if the Lord tarries, I am, I'm closer to the end of life than the beginning of it, at least in this human life. So because, hey, what, what, are, we, what are we trying to accomplish? What, what matters? And it's, it's so easy to look at the, I don't know about you, but the, the normal things of life and say, hey, what, what difference does it make? God kept showing up all over the place. I'm, I'm dealing in a conversation with, with a gentleman at a timeshare place. Anybody, ever been, anybody been in a timeshare conversation where it's only going to take an hour? They, they can't tell time because an hour conversation normally takes three hours. And we're, and we're dealing with this young man. And this young man makes a statement. He said, I was, I, I was at church. I appreciate the gentleman throwing out church. I was good. He's fishing, and he got a response from me. He was at church, and he'd taken a visiting friend, and this person who was speaking made a statement said, never buy a timeshare. And I asked him, I said, did you have Dave Ramsey in your church? And he looked at me startled. He said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, if you're not familiar, Dave Ramsey is, is a Christian man that gives financial advice. Uh, he's certainly principles of don't be a, don't be a borrower. He's a guy that yeah, if you're not paying cash for everything, he gives you an exemption for the house maybe. But if you bought a car and you had to finance it, he, credit cards, he hates credit cards. And so we got into a conversation, and it turns out this gentleman has a book on his desk about how to live a serious Christian life. So I'm at a timeshare presentation because I want to get my parking paid for and get to encourage another believer in the, in the state of Hawaii who appears to be serious about his relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's like, that's what it ought to be. We ought, to be, we ought to be looking to be iron sharpening iron. If you go to Walgreens today or Kroger today or Food Line today or, or, or Arby's today, you ought to be looking for opportunities to be an encouragement for the cause of Christ, whether it's for Christians to be encouraged or for the unsaved to come to Christ. What are we here for? And again, the nations, we're going to talk about, again, several nations that busted on Israel. And what were they there for? Again, God used them in different ways. But God is going to mete out judgments and ultimately get to chapter 28. 
that talks about the king of Tyrus, and it doesn't appear he has human, he, he's either a superhuman, or I, again, I believe, which most interpreters believe, is a reference to Satan himself. Satan is alive in a well and seeking to destroy. I, I don't know about you, but I, I continue to be dis- disgusted about the path that we go on. Um, and again, it's some of the juxtaposition of, of, of life itself is people who misappropriate God's blessings. And again, we live in a world where we're chasing after things. In fact, I was reading that the media, one of the great media outlets has now been encouraged that people are trying to give people counseling to not have abortions or, or some kind of negative connotation. The, the absolute bizarre. Uh, so again, what do I do with today's lesson? Again, there's going to be a lot of history, a fair amount of geography. The, the bottom line I'd encourage you to do is what I'm doing with this is saying, hey, if, if God gives me what I'm trying to invest for today, what is that? What do I want God to do? We, you know, every day is an invitation for us to ask God to bless us or curse us. Whether you're saved or unsaved, if you're unsaved, I encourage you. There's, the Bible tells us there's nothing positive you're doing. You might say, boy, that's mean. I, don't, I didn't write it. When God says in Isaiah that all our, all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and that filthy rags, if you go study out what that means, is more than just a, dirt, a dirty dishcloth or a dirty dust rag. It's, it's awful. It's disgusting. We encourage you to come to Christ as Savior. I mean, the, whole, the, the, the emphasis of this church is that folks have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I come to church this morning desiring to see folks get, get right with God, whether it's an unsaved person to get saved, a Christian to, to be encouraged. I, my prayers for today's lessons and today's preaching sessions are, are pretty simple. Unsaved folks get saved, and Christians either be blessed, be rebuked, be challenged. I don't think everybody needs to get busted on. Hey, today, maybe if you're, if you're doing what God wants you to do, you ought to be excited about God's house. We get to sing... What are we singing here? My faith is found a resting place, not in device nor creek. Crowned with many crowns, I've decided to follow Jesus, yet not I, but Christ through me. I want to be excited about what God's doing. This is, again, this ought to be a combination of, of cheerleading, rehabilitation center. If you and I come to church and just check in the box that we showed up in church, what are we doing? We ought to be saying, hey, God, God, show me something. Hey, you ought to be asking God, God, show me the ministry you want me to get called to. God, show me the mission field you want me to call to, whether it's a mission field of a grade school around the corner or church around the world. We're here for a purpose, to, to go do something for the Creator. And again, I'm, I, I could turn into a preaching message. I'm supposed to stay on lesson, and we got a lot to cover. We'll have a word of prayer, then we'll get in the lesson of, again, God's judgment upon multiple nations busting on Israel, and ultimately His, his disposition, what He thinks about Satan Himself and the nature of Satan. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll get in the lesson. Our Lord and our God, we love You. We need You. We are humbled uh, that You allow us, the Bible says, in earthen vessels to be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, Lord, incredible to consider. You walked with Adam physically in the garden, uh, and you walk with us, uh, Lord, through your Holy Spirit on a, on a regular basis as believers. Uh, Lord, the relationship you desire with us, the same one you desired with Adam in the garden, and you'll have with us in eternity when the, uh, the city comes down from heaven, as the book of Revelation tells us about. Lord, we pray today for your power to be loosed. We pray that your Holy Spirit would have liberty. Lord, we can uh, consider uh, the things of the world, the mountaineers that get a blowout wind yesterday, the weather that is uh, much warmer today than it was yesterday, and uh, Lord, the things of life can suck us in. There may be some great deal at a store. Lord, help us to be excited about you, uh, to be mindful of our lives, or not to be spent for time, but to be spent for eternity. Uh, Lord, we pray you'd help us to invest uh, the few minutes we have here in Sunday school and in the church services this morning and tonight. Uh, Lord, to, to be challenged, encouraged, blessed, we pray your Holy Spirit would fitly frame uh, all that's done, singing, preaching, giving, uh, to reach folks for Christ. If one needs Christ, that today be the day of salvation. Uh, if a Christian needs rebuked, uh, that you would do that and that, that someone would respond. Uh, Lord, if someone needs encouraged, if someone just needs to, to be reinforced uh, that we're on the victory side, that you would do that today. Lord, we love you. We need you. Bless and direct. Help us to honor you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Again, chapter 25, we'll start up. The first one, um, we're going to talk about multiple countries and God just bringing the hammer down on the enemies of Israel. And so the first country he's going to deal with are the Ammonites. First seven verses, next item. The, the Ammon came from Lot in the incestuous relationship. If you read Genesis chapter number 19, when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot has two daughters, and the daughters say, hey, we're, how, who are we going to, what's our heritage? And so they both have relations with their father, the Ammonites, uh, the first of that. And you might say, boy, what, a, what an awful situation, and certainly it was, but God had a special place for them. And it, it's, again, it's, it is exciting where God can create goodness out of badness. And you see that all over and over in Scripture, and I, frankly, I look at my life. My life was, the Bible tells me, I started, I was born in trespasses and sins. 
and God allows me to be part of, of his kingdom is, is incredible. But Deuteronomy 2.19, he calls out Ammon specifically and says to M Moses, given direction to the Israelites, says, And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of the Ammon for any possession, of any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. And you might say, what's the big deal about that? Well, if you read the early scripture, the first five books, and then get into Joshua, they're going after all kind of people. Hittites, I mean, they're just all kind of folks. Destroy, destroy, destroy. The Ammonites say, don't touch them because of Lot. And so because of one man, the Bible over, and again, Hebrews calls him just Lot. But this nation was against Israel. That God said, hey, don't touch them. Next item. And we can find multiple places where the Ammonites were a pain in the neck to the Israelites. Again, we're going to have a fair amount of verses today. I encourage mostly, again, scattered throughout the Old Testament. I'm not going to necessarily read all of them. Uh, but you can start up in Judges chapter 3, where the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the, the king of Moab, against Israel. Verse 13, he says, He gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and the Amalekites, they're just nasty folks, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. And you're going to see it again in Judges 11, 1 Samuel 14. Um, 1 Samuel 14, I'm going to read that because we're going to, we're going to see that referenced a couple, of, a couple of few times. Early in Saul's administration, once made king, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, it talks about, So Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab and against the children of Ammon and against Edom and against the children of Zobah and against the Philistines. And whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed them. And the Bible says he defeated him. I do encourage you, just as an aside, when you read the names of cities and people, hopefully you're not a person who just says, I don't know who those folks are. It's, it's important to pay attention who they are and where they came from. Some folks don't, again, some folks you only see once, but Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites are not all of the same ilk. We'll talk about a, a several of them today. Where they came from and where they're headed is important. So again, these Ammonites had been busting on Israel for years. It wasn't a new thing, even though God said, don't, don't bust on them. Next item. And like many groups, these folks were guilty of, of false gods. We get two choices in life. We either choose to serve Jehovah God or choose something else. And, and again, again we, we came back from Hawaii, and I'll, I'll mention several things from that just because of relevance. That Hawaii has it built, there's multiple places called, I don't know how you pronounce it, H E I A U. How does anybody, anybody know how to pronounce that? H E I A U, P I U, whatever you want to pronounce it. And they're nothing more than religious centers that the native Hawaiians had built. And in some of these places, they had stacked up rocks that they had pulled up from the coast and against stark mountains in Hawaii, where folks had apparently spent months and months and months to go make these stacks of rocks as temples and worship areas, mostly to the things around them. Again, they would worship the nature around them, the, the beauty of the seas and all those kinds of things. And it is sad that folks appropriated God's creation and, and turned it into a worship. Uh, and, and sadly, here, here in the United States on the mainland, I don't, I don't know that folks consider their, their worship of different things. Again, I'm a sports fan, but there's some folks that take that to, to bizarre levels, that sports are more important than anything else in the world. You know, a worship, when I put something ahead of, of God on a, on a continual, regular basis, becomes my area of worship. And these folks with false gods would make images and idols, and again, you, you can see that in lots of places. Uh, Judges chapter number 10 uh, one of the places, verse number six, again, the situation here is Judge Jer, Jer the Gileadite has passed off the scene. Verse six says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served him not, or served not him. And so we're going we're gonna to hear reiterated some of those other folks. First Kings chapter 11 is the sad testimony of one of the smartest, wisest men that ever lived, a guy named Solomon. And, in, and that starts out with his challenge. King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. And the problem, of, among other things, verse number 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the god of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And this false god fascination is just bizarre. But what do we do that, allow, that we allow to distract us? I mean, I ask myself. I mean, yeah, I don't have any little statues in my, in my office, but do I let work become a distraction or pleasure become a distraction? Or, you know, I, get, I keep thinking about retirement and, oh, is, is my 401K more important than my relationship with the Creator? 
And if it is, I am a fool. If my education, if my children, if my grandchildren, and, and spending time with them is more important than my relationship with the Creator. So it's not necessarily even bad things, but anything I want to put ahead of God is problematic. Next item. So this group's got all kinds of issues. And so God tells him in, in Ezekiel 25, he says, I'm just sick and tired of you. Verse number three says, Thus saith the Lord God to the Ammonites, Because thou sayest, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. These folks were making fun of the Jews. That aha that's said in there is to beg the question, which shows up multiple times in the Old Testament. Moses had this debate with God. It says, God, if you destroy the people, what will people think of you? And yet these people knew that they were servants of Jehovah God, and they were destroyed. How, how does your God allow you to fall into captivity? So they're making fun of him in verse 3. And he tells them, Behold, therefore I will deliver thee to the men of the east for possession, and they shall set their palaces in thee and make their dwellings in thee. They shall eat their fruit, and they shall drink thy milk. He's letting them know the Babylonians are going to go hammer them. Who were in authority right then? One thing about the Ammonites, the Ammonites do not exist as a country today. The Babylonians hammered them, and you don't see them in the New Testament. Historically, they disappeared. And in large part because they shook their fist against God's people. God had protected them against Israel. He said, Israel, don't touch these people. But God decides to put the hammer on them because they choose to, to judge God's people. Never a good thing to take a side against God's people, which still applies today. If we want to, again, the nation of Israel is not all that they should be, but, but the Bible is really clear. God's promises to Abraham did not depend upon us as people. It all depends upon him. Next time. And so we go from Ammon, the next group is going to be the Moabites in the, the next section, verse number, verses number 8 through 11. In the next bullet, see the stuff above? Yeah, just do it again. They too, they were the other child of the other daughter of Lot. They are descendants of Lot. They, got it, they fought against Israel for years. And again, lots of verses there we're not going to go through, some of which are repeat verses, where they fought against Israel. They were one of the thorns in the side. But again, the Ammonites and the Moabites are not the same as the Hivites and the Jebusites and some of these others. So I encourage you again to study those out. Different groups of people that came from different places with different, again, different blessings. But they too had false gods that God warned them about. They too had, had offended, had fought against God. Again, the book of Judges fought against Israel. Um, Solomon, for all of his wisdom, I, I try to imagine, I try to understand what Solomon was thinking. Solomon, who was blessed beyond measure. I mean, he had, he had physical talks with God. The whole, the whole prayer of God, give me wisdom, and God says, I'll give you more of the wisdom, I'll give you stuff. And it was incredible, the, the kingdom in which Solomon had, if you read about that, where silver was counted as nothing. How does he get to a place that he chases after not just the Ammonites God and not just the Moabites God, but he chases after all kind of craziness? And then I look in the mirror and say, well, Mike, you live in the greatest country on the face of the planet. What causes you to be unconcerned about the souls of men? What causes you to not care? What causes you to be full of yourself as opposed to concerned about the things of others? And it's like, yeah, I don't have Solomon's stuff, but I need to be careful that I can get caught up in life. And life is great. I don't know about you. How many folks enjoy life? Man, I got up this morning, I got in my shower, and the hot water ran. I've got clean restroom. I had, I had Diet Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. I even have... For some people, I, have diet, I even have diet sun-kissed orange in my garage that I can drink. I couldn't find it. I mean, it's just some place you can't find it everywhere. Got it made. And so he said just to live life thinking about, hey, I've got cable TV. I've got, I've got internet. I've got cell phones. I've got all this stuff I could buy. Man, and the Mountaineers blew out Oklahoma. I don't keep saying that because it's such a fun thing where if you're a Mountaineer fan, you had to like yesterday where they won. I think they won by, by 178 points or something. And it's so easy to get sucked into life and miss the point of, hey, life is more than just you. And again, here's the, the little things of life. My, my, my friend Dave Newsom has, has a daughter that, that lives over in Maui. So it's like, okay, what? that's kind of cool. You guys got time for a story? Sure you do. Um, so I got the address and all, and I, I've got a picture of her mailbox. I'm not sure which house she lives in because I wasn't quite sure. And it's, I call these the God little things. So we go to the, the Maui, and so she, she's teaching school. She teaches school at a, a little place in Kihai, Hawaii which I understand why people live there, beautiful place. Um, didn't, get, didn't get a hold of it, again, don't know what school this and that. So we go to the Maui airport to, to fly home, and there happens to be a book laying in the chair in which we sit called Maui Family. And if you've been in airports, they don't normally have family magazines. There's normally, you know, about tourism and all this other kind of stuff. So in the Maui Family magazine, you turn to page 17, 
And it's like, oh, yeah, there's this Montessori school in North Kei, Hawaii. And so I go to their website, and there's the picture of Dave Newsman. It's like, why, did, why does God put a Maui family book in the Maui airport in the seat I'm sitting in near the gate that we catch on? And you might say, what's the big deal about that? It, yeah, it could have been just a pure coincidence. I'm thinking God, God creates connections everywhere, just a matter of us looking for them. And the part that bothers me is how many times do I not pay attention? I mean, we passed all kind of homeless people. Hey, is that a homeless person I should have cared about? Or a homeless person I just shake my head at? You know, what a God that we're not caught up like the Moabites and the Ammonites chasing our own ways and our own stuff and our own gods. Again, I don't think we're building idols, hopefully, in your house, but we can create idols out of the things we got. Again, two nations that God said, and the Babylonians destroyed them as well. Next item. The next group is the Edomites. And if you're not familiar with the Edomites, next item. Next few verses, God's going to hammer them as well. These guys were descendants of Esau. So they too came from the line of Abraham. This, those folks directly from Abraham, right? Es- Esau, the, the less popular son than, than Jacob. And you can read the whole situation about, about Esau, who got a blessing from Abraham, certainly not the blessing that he'd hoped to get after the whole trickery that, that Rebekah had done with Isaac and Jacob. I still try to imagine that situation. I'm trying to see. I can't, Isaac, I can't see, but boy, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. Has anyone ever like felt the arms of your kids to figure out which one they were? I've never tried that. I've, I'll get Ryan and Jason and Rachel in here. We'll go, I'm going to touch their arms and see if I know who's who's who. But that's the situation, if you read the situation with the, the blessing that Esau didn't get because it went to Jacob. And God spends an entire chapter, Genesis chapter 36, of the generations of Esau. And again, the Edomites come from Esau, verse 1. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And the first time you see kings, they call them dukes in there, are the generations of Edom. In fact, verse number 31 I found fascinating. I never paid attention to getting ready for the lesson. Genesis 36, 31 says, And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. That the, and again, the Edomites were not good people. They were, they were nasty folks. Next item, Th- their descendants are guilty of some, some nasty things. Uh, you can read about that in, in several places. Uh, first, first Samuel chapter 17, uh, the, the nasty, nastiness of, of the Edomites. You're going to see Doeg, the Edomite, nasty guy. Um, next item. Even though related. In Israel was ultimately going to be the judge for them. God did not say, don't touch them like he said to the Ammonites and, and to, the, to the Moabites. So Israel was allowed to go hammer them. In fact, God says that in, verses, in chapter, chapter 25 of Ezekiel. That I will stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man from it. Because as verse 12 talks about, the, the Judah is going to take revenge against these folks. And we see that later on. You're going to find that as a, as a preview in Ezekiel chapter 35. And you're going to see that in other places that we're going to, um, in Ezekiel, we're going to see judgments that are yet to come about these folks, where chapter 35 talks about setting his face against Mount Seir. Mount Seir is going to be a, a place of worship of the Edomites. So you don't see the, the Edomites mentioned in chapter 35, the beginning verses, but that's a judgment that comes. Next item. The next folks are, is the nation of Philistia. We think of the Philistines. And if you were to put a map, you would see these folks kind of in a circle around Israel. If you were to go back to that time, the Ammonites were in a certain area, the Moabites in a certain area, Philistia was in a certain area. And so the next few verses, the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it. The Philistines were certainly not fans of Israel ever. Next item. Where did these guys come from? Well, these folks were descendants of, if, if Noah were to have a favorite son, we're not sure about if he had a favorite, but we're pretty certain he had a, a less favorite that Ham, the one that we're not exactly sure what he did, but there was a curse put upon Ham and the Canaanites because of what he did in, in Genesis chapter number 9. But we find that these folks, in Genesis 10, 14, the descendants of Ham lead to verse 14 that says, and Pathrusim and Kasluim, out of who came Philistim, which is the leader of the Philistines, and Kaptorim. So out of this cursed group, one of Noah's sons is Philistia. Next item. And most of us are familiar with the Philistines, especially one particular one, right? I mean, the great, I mean, David and Goliath, old David Goliath situation, Goliath was of Gath, was the Philistine. They had no use for Israel, continually a thorn in the side. Next item. 
So lots of stuff we're going to go through, but we're going to hit a lot of these fast. And so God says, I'm going to go hammer you guys. And just as he did with the great victory that David had over Goliath. Again, that's how, how ridiculous is that David beat Goliath? I mean, they talk about that. I'm, again, I'm a sports fan, and when, a sport, when sports has a huge upset a bunch of years ago, Villanova beat Georgetown in an NCAA basketball final in, in two games where the talent levels were not even close. And it's David beats Goliath. Oh, no, the, the, David and Goliath didn't have any sense being on the same battlefield. Goliath, enormous man with enormous army, and David's out there with some sling and not even any kind of battle gear. It's like, what are we doing? And are you, are you kidding me? He, he, he slings a rock and hits the guy just perfectly. Got me a break. Has anybody ever used a slingshot? I tie my rocks in there and say it has a real problem. That's ridiculous. Come on. Truly a God thing. Just incredible that David would. I mean, so it's just beyond bizarre. Because the Philistine just shaking his fist. Again, the, the whole nature of the David Goliath situation is Goliath's complete disregard for the things of God. And the Philistines, they. You know, they were concerned whether it were you were the God of the valley or the God of the, of the mountains in a, in a different situation where they were going to fight against Israel. And so God said, I'm going to hammer him, just as he had done before. All these nations. And so, and so what do I do with that? And we're going to continue on next item. I think it takes to the next page, right? We go through four nations in chapter 25. It's like, what do I do with that? Hey, did you have opposition in life to your Christian life that is not just you? If you have people in life or situations... Again, my desire is not for folks to get judged. I know there's some people who have no use for this book that I've talked to personally. No use for the God of heaven. No use, uh, in fact, have made light of the scriptures. You know, how could God do this and how could God do that? I have no desire that any of them be judged like any of those four nations we just talked about. And would to God we don't get to a place that we despise people so much we'd rather them see them judged than forgiven. Because something for us not to lose sight, unlike these folks who had made choices that, that were beyond, beyond turning. Hopefully, as we deal with people, we don't look at them that way and say, man, the, the person who's engaged in behaviors that are completely horrible. I mean, I've been, again, reading over the past few weeks about some situations of how, how does somebody do that to their, own, to their own children or their own grandchildren, just some, some horrible things. Hey, those folks need the Savior. So, again, let's not lose sight of that. It's so easy to get on the bandwagon, ah, judge them, judge them. No, God, I want you to forgive them because they need help. One thing that did strike me as odd is so God spends 17 verses to talk about judgment upon four nations, and then he takes almost three chapters to talk about one city, and it's the city of Tyre. And the city of Tyre, next time, again, we're not going to read all of 26, 27, and part of 28. Tyre was a happening place. I mean, Tyre was not some insignificant, and again, I know we, we get culturally... You know, to, to think about the city of Tyre, what a great location. I mean, it was beachfront property on the east side of the Mediterranean Sea. If you look at a map, Tyre was in modern-day Syria, and I think they've still got things there that have from the city after it's been destroyed. A happening place, Joshua chapter 19. Did I have the wrong verse? Oh, sorry, yeah. Joshua chapter 19, verse 29, talks about the inheritance of the different, nation, the, the different uh, sons of Israel. And the Asherites were to inherit what was then Tyre. In verse 29, he uses this term. He says, And then the coast turneth to Ramah and to the strong city Tyre. Happen to play, again, beachfront property, next item. Tyre and, and were actually some friends to Israel. It is difficult to find a place where, prior to this, where God said, hey, you were fighting against Israel. And so it's, it's curious why God throws them into judgment on a far broader. When the four countries we looked at, you can find battle after battle after battle after battle after battle. Well, these guys, and, and especially with, with their leader, a guy named Hiram, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11, says, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David in cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. 1 Kings chapter 5. Th this guy even continues past David into Solomon's situation. 1 Kings 5, 11. In fact, chapter 5 talks a lot about Hiram, king of Tyre, verse 1. The Bible calls him a ever, ever a lover of David. Verse 11, Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil, and thus gave, Solomon, thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. Verse 12 talks about him being in a league together. These guys were friends. Hiram, again, was helpful in the building of the temple. The material, Many of the materials that were for the temple came from Tyre. And again, Tyre, next item, 
we're going to see what its purpose in life was, was a very prosperous place. And I call this a hint of the problem. And as I got ready for the lesson, if I was thinking about America and the idolatry that we have with the things that we have, the city of Tyre just jumped out at me when we go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13, again, the rebuilding of the temple that happened in there. But verse 16 talks about, there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, talking about again in, in Jerusalem, in which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil this thing is this ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. That these folks weren't doing something overtly to go bust on Israel. But because of their prosperity, they were ignoring God's word and say, hey, we're going to do things our way. And, and again, as I'm getting ready for lesson, I thought, man, I'm far less likely to go bust on God's people than to be guilty of tire type sins. Than because, hey, we got so much stuff. Has anybody got stuff in your house? You know, there's those tests. Has anybody got clothes in your closet you've never worn? Shoes that you wear once in a blue moon? I mean, if we have more than three pairs of shoes, we've got too many, right? You need a work shoe and a play shoe and a dress shoe. Is that? And if there's anybody in the room with only three pairs of shoes, you let me know. I'll give you something because i got more than three pairs of shoes. I mean, it's ridiculous. I've got like four pairs. I'm the guy that wears the grandpa tennis shoes. I think I've got four pairs of those, one that you use to work out in, one that you wear around, and then the two that i got spare when those others wear out. It's, it's a sad situation. Pray for me. But tires problem, they had too much stuff. Next item. And so how do I know that that's the, the precursor? Because God spends the entire chapter in chapter 27 talking about all their stuff. Again, Tyre would be a place, again, the way it's described, that you would want to go on vacation. Just a very nice place. Verse number 3, O thou that art situated at the entry of the city, which art a merchant of the people for many isles. Verse 4, thy borders are in the midst of the sea, thy builders have perfected thy beauty. And he talks about all the things they have. It's a, it's a, it was a trade center. He talks about the shipboards of fir trees of Sinir, the cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Bashan. The Asherites made benches of ivory. I mean, fine linen with broidered works out of Egypt. It was a place where transaction happened. I, I think of it almost like a New York City as a place of transaction. And it goes on and on and on and on. There were smart people in verse 8, thy wise men, O Tyrus, that were in thee, were thy pilots. And again, it's talking about boats, not about planes. If you're not familiar, there were no airplanes in that day. And if you didn't know that, we'll, we'll pray for you. You need some help. They did all kind of things. I mean, you'll find about what they traded, what they did. They were merchants. They were just blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. Next item. But sadly, their leader had a problem. And so the reference in chapter 28 is to the prince of Tyre. And the reason I say, who do you think you are? Here was the description. The prince of Tyre is the city leader. And Tyre, again, this kind of a city state, if you will. Here's the accusation from God. Because thine heart is lifted up and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the sea, yet thou art a man and not God. And as, as the audacity of verse number two, I was amazed with the, the statement God makes in verse number three. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Are you kidding me? This guy was, Daniel was no slouch. And God's attribution is, yeah, you were, you're wiser than Daniel, no secret thing hide from me. With thy wisdom, with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. Apparently, this guy was an entrepreneur. And again, we have those in the United States today, right? I mean, you got guys like Elon Musk that, I'm assuming Elon Musk products show up. Does, does anybody, you know, whether it's Twitter or SpaceX, Elon Musk gets a lot of negative press. But my understanding, he has enabled an internet thing called Starlink to allow the Ukrainians to communicate and has charged nothing for that. And again, I'm not an Elon Musk fan. I'm not here to either promote him or, or denigrate him. But entrepreneurs are everywhere. There's a guy named Mark Cuban, entrepreneur, owner of the Dallas Mavericks. And, and I'm thinking about take, taking some of his products. Um, apparently, he's, he's, he's disgusted with the high price of pharmaceuticals. He has started something. I was, I was looking at one particular medicine that we use where it's going to cost $90 at a certain place. He's got it for 6 bucks. His, and he's he made the statement, I don't even care if I make any money. That's how I make medicine. Does anybody think medicine costs too little? It should cost more. Is there anybody in the room like that? I'm not here to bust on medical things. I think it's tremendous. Some of the things that can be done with medicine. What price would I pay on something that would extend my life when something's going to kill me? 
But again, Cuban's desire is, hey, I'm gonna, I, don't, I don't care. And if it drives down things, great. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. This guy's the ultimate entrepreneur. This Prince of Tyre, bright guy, making money. And is there anything wrong with either of those things? I think the answer is no. The problem is when you think, verse 2, hey, I'm God, I'm in charge. And that becomes the ego of things. For instance, again, Mark Cuban, owner of the Mavericks, certainly gets his fair amount of negative press because he, he, he does like himself. And if you ever watch Shark Tank TV show, you'll, you'll find that out. I don't think Mark Cuban's ever said he's God. But there are some human beings that think they're above the law, which is the essence of who God is. When I'm God, I'm in charge. And so when leadership, again, that's the challenge of leadership, to, to pray for leaders, to not get so full of themselves that they think they're above the law. And God lays it out in verse 6. He says, Because thou hast set thy heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore I'll bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords. Verse 9, God kind of makes a mockery. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? What a statement. Hey, before the guy kills you, you're going to say you're God? Well, that's obviously, well, obviously not. But thou shalt be a man and know God. God's not going to share his glory with anybody. And what's that got to do with you and I? Do you, does anybody in the room foolish enough to think that we're God? Hopefully not. But when we think we're smarter than he is because of how we've got to live our lives or we know better than he does on what decisions to make, we're essentially making that statement saying, God, we're, we, we're in charge. And that is completely unacceptable to the creator God that we serve. Next item. And the second city that goes with Tyre, when you, when you think of the scriptures, you might think of Tyre and Sidon together. Another city on the Mediterranean Sea, probably 15 miles from Tyre. Between them was the city of Zarephath, which the widow of Zarephath ministered. And God spends a few verses on them that says, oh yeah, Zidon, you're going to have the same problem. Next item. They were blessed. Isaiah chapter 23 talks about the blessings of that city. Again, locationally, they were a, good, a great port, not quite as popular as Tyre, but certainly useful. Next item. Unlike, unlike our friends at Tyre, the, the Zidonians, you're going to find it, and you'll, you'll see it spelled with a Z in several places. Zidon, same city. Zidon and Zidon. Verse number 24 says, And there shall, no, sh there shall be no more a pricking briar under the house of Israel. And I think about that. I grew up on the farm picking blackberries. I mean, anybody pick blackberries? Blackberries would be great to pick, except for those little thorns on there. You'd come out. I had two different colors on my hand. I wasn't sure if the, if the red blood from being pricked was matched up with the purple from the blackberries. It was kind of a mixture. So I think of prickling briars. I can feel it. They're irritations. But these folks fought against Israel. Next item. Yeah, but both of those is okay. God was going to hammer them as well. And I like the, the but is Jesus mentions those two cities, Matthew chapter 11, Luke chapter 10, kind of a similar thing, and he makes the statement, which is to me a great warning. He's talking about the cities where he did work that didn't repent, and he says in verse number 20, uh, verse 21 of Matthew 11, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in ash cloth, sackcloth and ashes. And it strikes me, we have the complete canon of Scripture. Not only, we don't get to see physically the works of Jesus, we get to read about them and know that they're real. That God is wanting us to pay attention to that. Hey, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. We are responsible for more. Next item. And so all these cities, he uh, used the term the real offender, because in, in Ezekiel 28, they talked about the prince of Tyre, who most believe was actually the, the physical leader of Tyre. Because the description about the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, 11 and following don't sound like they fit a human being. Next item. Let's, let's, let's start, and again, I'll attribute it to Satan for, for reason. Verse number 12 that says, Thus saith the Lord about the lamentation among King of Tyre, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thank you. Give me some of that stuff. How would you like to, be, how would you like to have that description of you? You are full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Smart and good looking. The kind of person you want your son or your daughter or your granddaughter or your grandson to marry. Man. This is great. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's not Satan. Next item. The next item makes it, and I say he's not Adam or Eve. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And from God's recording, there was only four folks in the garden. God himself who walked through, Adam and Eve, and the serpent who was Satan's possessed. So again, Genesis chapter 3's account, and of course the serpent, given a kind of a bizarre thing, if someone would say, well, it was just a snake. Well, if it was just a snake... What's the point of verse 15 that says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
Again, the first prophecy about Jesus, thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus was certainly wounded with having to go to Calvary for us on the cross. But it shall bruise thy head. I don't know about you. Which would you rather have squashed on, your, your, your heel or your head? I don't like when my heel hurts, but I certainly don't like if my head got squished. Again, this is a reference to Satan himself. And what a statement about Satan. If Satan, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, blessed. And we're going to continue on. Next item. The attributes of Satan. I'm like, what were you thinking? Verse 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. And you might read those things and say, what's, what's the big deal about all that stuff? If you go to Exodus chapter 39 and the breastplate of the priest, all of those items mentioned in verse 13 of Ezekiel 28 are mentioned in the, in, the, in the 12, there were 12 jewels, 12 stones in the breastplate of the priest that was surrounded by gold. And all 10 of those that are listed are 10 of the 12. And I'll be honest, I don't, I don't quite understand why that's, what's, what's the deal with that? Was God creating him to be, again, I believe God created Satan to serve a particular, a particular role that he failed to serve. And to be the priest, the priestly reminders, hey, here's some things. I again, I can't confirm that, but it seems more than curious that all 10 of those items listed there are 10 of the 12 jewels of Exodus 39. Next item. And it continues on. Satan just blessed. He's the music guy. The Bible says if you continue past the jewels, the workman of thy tabrets, tambourines, you might think of this, and thy pipes, wind instruments, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. He is the master of music. Psalm 50 talks a lot about some of those instruments. And I encourage you to do a study of music in the Scripture. For those that think the music doesn't matter, you are foolish. I mean, the Bible talks about David playing the instrument that, calmed, that made the evil spirit disappear. Music has serious power, again, physical power. Right? Anybody ever listen to music and your foot starts tapping for no reason? We are, again, we are creatures where music makes a difference. I was, I was on the airplane coming back trying to sleep, and so I started, I listened to some heavy metal music, right? Right? You might say, are you an idiot? No. What did I, when, when I want to listen to music to go to sleep, what do I listen to? Classical music. Da, 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 da. But of course, the baby crying keeps you from doing that. Um, music has power. And God intended, and again, Satan has used it sadly in, in more than corrupt ways. We could get into a whole lesson on the, the perversion of music that, is, that has happened. He was blessed with the, with the music talent. Next item. And I say, what a testimony. Here's how God created him. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Wow. Doesn't it beg the question, Satan, what's wrong with you? You had a maid. The irony, if you ask the average person, where has Satan spent more time, heaven or hell? Most would say, well, Satan, he's the, he's the king of hell. No, Satan's never been to hell, but he's been in heaven. And he was blessed beyond measure. You know, verse, again, the, the, word of, uh, verse, the third word of verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub. He was the best of the best. What are you thinking? Next item. And the three dots mean there's something more to come until I say the verse 15, the end of verse 15, till iniquity was found in thee. And again, I encourage, again, I encourage us to do a study of Satan to see how blessed beyond measure. Again, he's described there but how full of himself in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, that talks about how it's our fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how it's our cut to the ground. What was his problem? He had an ego problem. Verse 13, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit upon the mount of the God. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high at the end of verse 14. And God hammers him in verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. God kicks Satan out of heaven again. Angels that followed him went with that. And that brought down to the hell to the side of the pit a prophecy about him that is yet to be fulfilled, but it's coming. Satan was blessed beyond measure, and God attributes the blessings of Tyrus to Satan himself. Next item. And his end, again, Tom is not going to give us, we're not going to go through all the details of that, but because his heart was lifted up, he's going to be taken down. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Revelation 20, verse 10, after he's locked into the, to the bottomless pit, 
the thousand year reign of Christ and then he's loosed for a certain season and then cast into the lake of fire for eternity. Don't get me wrong, Satan is alive and well, seeking and destroy, and he's got capability. Again, the capability God gave him. He is a deceiver, a cheat, a liar, but not greater than our Creator, not greater than the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, not greater than the Holy Spirit of God. Next item. And then wedged in here, a couple of verses at the end. Hey, Israel, I'm going to take care of you. Israel, again, the whole situation, they're in judgment, they're in captivity. Jerusalem's about, to, is, again, relatively fallen. Everything looks like destruction. God says, hey, God, guys, by the way, I'm going to take care of you. All your enemies are going to be defeated. In the last two verses, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they were scattered and shall be sanctified in them, then shall they dwell in their land. And the conclusion about, I mean, verse 26, they shall dwell safely, shall build houses, plant vineyards, they shall dwell with confidence. When I've executed judgments upon all those who despise them round about them. And the message of Ezekiel said for the umpteenth time, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. And the Jews are still looking for that day. That day is yet to come. One of the challenges when Jesus came is they were looking for that day. They said, God, hammer all these enemies. And God, of course, said it's not time yet. So what do I do with that? Next, two, next slide, only two questions to ask. I know we're running a little bit long. Enemies are around. Again, we don't have the Sidonians, and we don't have the Moabites, and we don't have the Ammonites and the Philistines. we got enemies. And the challenge in my life, what, do I do? what am I doing to let the enemies influence me? There are folks that shake their fist, and it can be not necessarily even aligning with them. You know, I can get so mad politically at those that want to defend positions against God that it distracts me. Don't get mad. Be prayerful. You know, I pray, I pray for things that, frankly, I struggle to even to believe. God, God, turn America around from the, the sexual perversion and gender perversion and abortion perversions that we chase after. Let's make sure we're on God's perspective. And then the last part, what am I doing to address the reality of Satan's attack? Satan alive and well trying to destroy me, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, my church, my country. 1 Peter 5, 8 is a serious assertion. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking human to devour. God wants to destroy teenagers with, with sex and alcohol and drugs. God wants to destroy old people with money and things and perversion and self-centeredness. I'm not trying to fight Satan. I'm trying to let the, the Word of God and let the Spirit of God do that. But Satan seeks inroads. Satan seeks inroads and lots of kind of things. What are we doing to, to gird ourselves, as the Bible would say, gird our loins, the, the armor of Ephesians chapter number 6, to, to stand up for truth in a world that seems to chase after nonsense. I'm glad, just as Israel was going to be delivered, that there's coming a day, if you trusted Christ as Savior, that we get to lay aside the glasses, we get to lay aside the other things that are problematic, and that God's going to be in charge. But until that day, if you're a believer, let's invest today for eternity. Get excited about what God wants to do in the 11 o'clock hour to change hearts and lives, including yours. We've got to be asking God, God, show me what you want me to be. Am I supposed to get involved in after-school clubs in this area? Am I supposed to get involved in things around the church here? Am I supposed to go to some other ministry thing? Who, is there a family I should adopt to be a blessing to? What does God want us to do to defeat Satan and the minions that seek to destroy the kingdom and, and dishonor the Creator who has blessed us in so many ways? Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we love you. We need you. We are humbled at your goodness to us. Uh, Lord, just as the Israelites had enemies in the land, we have enemies on, on every hand. That Satan, sadly, is alive and well, using the, the very talents and blessings that you gave him uh, of wisdom and skill, uh, his abilities and his conniving and his cunning. This, the Scripture said that he appears as an angel of light. Uh, Lord, he is a deceiver. Uh, Lord, we pray for your grace to serve you. Help us to realize that, again, greater is he that's in us than he is in the world. Lord, we pray for Gazan, one here that needs Christ, that today be the day of salvation. Uh, we pray you to, again, help each of us uh, to be obedient to you, that you uh, listen to your Holy Spirit, uh, to do that which you'd have us to do. Lord, bless the service to follow. We pray for incredible things to be done that'll matter for eternity. Lord, we love you. We